Okay, so why don't we, 7.55, we'll officially start the meeting. Boop. Um, under Massachusetts law, we are able to meet virtually. Uh, there are a couple of conditions, one of which is when we take a vote, we have to do a roll call vote, but we have become accustomed to that. So thank you, everybody. We now have a quorum, so we will begin. Uh, apologies for the late start. And um, our speaker is not here. So perhaps he got frustrated or had the same trouble we did getting in. But hopefully, we if he can't join us, we can reschedule him. Steve, thank you for reaching out to him. Um, and I realized I did not send him the agenda because I did not. Oh, have no. Then he won't even address. have the link. <laughs> well, the link, I mean, I don't know. Well, I guess his email address is. Well, it's be asking website. a lot of him to search on the uh, town website and find the agenda for AEC and et cetera. I promise. No, no, I know. Him, so I, I don't know if that's. Did you send him the agenda or a link? Uh, let's see. For some reason, my. my, my okay. I'll forward this to him. All right, in the meantime, what we can do, hopefully everybody received a copy of the final draft of the meeting minutes from last May, um, last month. And if you haven't, I'll give everybody a moment to quickly review them and then I would uh, love a motion to accept the meeting minutes, or if you have any changes for us to discuss, we're happy to discuss. So I want you to take a moment to read that. Did everybody receive a copy of those minutes today? Yes. Yes. I wasn't here last month, so I will abstain. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so we know your vote. You'll have to do it as part of the roll call. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I'll second. Is there any discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Tanya Bodell, aye. Chris Alderson, aye. Oh. <laughs> Debbie Cook, aye. Steve. Josh and I will aye. Pick. Steve Winter, aye. And Josh? I will abstain. Okay, perfect. So I will send a final version of this and the other two. I did go into my inbox and realize that the March 16th meeting minutes I had sent to get posted and they never got posted. So I sent a reminder today to get those posted, but we should be caught up um, with this and the last two meetings and posting the March 16th, which we had approved and sent for posting. So we'll be caught up on our minutes. Um, Thank you, Debbie, again for amazing meeting minutes. Um, is this Debbie is when we would have our speaker, minutes? but with the late start and potential confusion, um, perhaps he may not be attending at this point. If not, we will try to get him at a future date. Um, Steve, you've spot spoken to John Hallen, I assume, yeah. as part of this process. Yeah. And He's did he give any John. insight into what? Does he have deep knowledge in this? Have they already implemented the stretch I, code? I didn't ask him. I didn't to get into it. I just explained to him that we were trying to learn about it and we were interested in his experience. And but you know that was it. Okay. I didn't. I didn't ask, and he didn't offer. So I was just. All right. Well, let's. If he doesn't join us on this meeting, Steve, if you could ask him to join us the next meeting. Okay. And then let's make sure we forward. So if you could forward him the meeting, the agenda, I'll forward him the agenda. We're yeah, trying just, to get the agenda I just sent out. Him the agenda. You did. Okay. But as far as the next one, we can send it to him yeah. in advance, let him know it's a second. Yeah. So we're going into summer. Sometimes summer is difficult. The next meeting would be July 13th, the second Thursday. Does anybody know if they have an issue at this point? I think I do. Um, all 
All right. Well, let's yeah, figure that out. We also want to try to get some. Um, no, new I think I'll be all right. Was anybody able to meet with Justin to push the alternative energy committee and talk about how great we are and how fun we have, <laughs> how much fun we have? No. All I haven't right. from the last couple outreaches to Justin, so I'm not. But we can discuss um, how great we are and what we how we, what we want to get out there for the next you know segment that we can pass over to him. Okay, let's right. do that for marketing and social media. Yeah, I okay. mean, I, I I contacted him and you know, and he said he was really all set. So so uh, anyway. Okay. And I apologize because I was in Kentucky this week and I was in California last week. So the last two weeks have been crazy between graduation, prom, travel, business, everything. But um, we're going into the summer. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more relaxing and we can mm -hmm. enjoy the best that Cohasset offers um, with our summer season. Okay, EcoFest debrief. Why don't we make it an action item, Debbie? I'll follow up with Justin just to make sure he truly does have what he needs. And if he needs to get a quick little blurb, we can arrange to have us do a Zoom call with him or something. Okay, so you said you would do that? You'd contact yeah, Justin? Yeah, I'll follow up with him. Just yeah. to make sure he got what he needed. But thank you, Debbie, for following up with him. Yeah. Okay. EcoFest debrief. Okay. Um, let me just write that. Okay. So, um, so basically, um, the debrief was um, actually we got a little um, something today from um, Ginny, who basically said they thought maybe five hundred more people came to EcoFest. They made. Six thousand um, dollars this year, as opposed to three thousand last year. Our my little thing raised um, sixteen hundred of that, so at least. Um, so so, no, it was more than that, twenty one hundred. Um, so that so that was profitable to them. The the vendor thing. Um, Where does that money go? So it's actually, it's going to, I think they've set up like a, a foundation and it goes to sustainable uh, pe um, kids, you know, can apply for it at their schools and it funds projects, sustainable projects at schools. So I don't know the projects that they're currently funding. Um, I don't even, I don't know, you know, what they're looking to do next year. But I do know that's that's the goal is to fund sustainable projects at schools. And who's so, they? So there is a steering committee, um, and uh, Jenny's actually on that steering committee. Um, and um, so basically, yeah, they they've organized. Um, we did have a lot of comments, you know, from vendors and, and, uh, you know, if we do it again, or I, I know they're going to do it again. Um, there are going to be some, some changes, especially in the thing that I was most concerned about was the marketing and public relations. Um, and, um, unfortunately I didn't realize until like <laughs> I came up for air that, nothing was getting done about it. So they're going to have a um, marketing and PR committee, which which is wonderful. And that should they, make a big They is uh, the steering committee. The and steering is this committee. a, like, is this a nonprofit? Is this an official it's committee? It's a nonprofit. It... It's a nonprofit. It's called Just One Bag. It was started by Sarah Burgess. She's the, she is the one who, with her family was picking, you know, encouraging people to pick up one bag of trash every time they went to the beach or went out. Um, so it's the Just One Bag Foundation. And um, she moved to England and she flew back for the EcoFest and I think really wants to uh, to keep it going. So, so she does have Marissa Manley is, I think is, is acting um, as the chair 
and um, the, the two of them communicate a lot. So I think I'll be on the committee next year. Okay, good. So, and then, and then the follow-up, I think I talked about the follow-up at the library, right? You know, that, that they put up a display at the library, you know, working toward the all electric home. And that was sort of a add on to uh, EcoFest. And yep. I've, I've mentioned that before. So that's in the library. So you should pop in and see it. Um, and uh, so basically, that's my report. Okay. Um, great report. And it was a great event. And I want to thank everybody on this committee for showing up. It was awesome. The, the, participation by this committee was impressive and Debbie you did an amazing table and then the solar hot water heater we staffed that one too which was awesome and the whole <laughs> event was amazing so they had 1500 people Ginny estimated or somebody estimated versus a thousand last year and doubled the funds and we got to showcase what we're doing <clears throat> Very well done. Yeah, great job. Does anybody there. else want to comment on EcoFest 2023? Uh, great job, Debbie. Yeah, it was great to see so many people out there. And um... well, I thank you all for participating. Everybody, every one of you stepped to the plate, and that really was was impressive. So thank you. Well, thanks Very for great. organizing it. We had the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Debbie, you did it. The line share. All we had to do was show up. Um, okay, grants. I can give a little bit of an update on what I know. Um, electric school bus demonstration project finally assigned. This is where I yeah, pull out woo. the champagne <laughs> for everybody. Pop the cork and we pour, pretend I'm pouring champagne for everybody uh, as a part of a congratulations. <laughs> The electric school bus demonstration project, the contract has been signed by the schools with an L and they anticipate we'll have the bus ready to go before the beginning of the school year. And they, at this point in the contract, have put in a condition that they can move the charging station for a fee. So I don't know where the schools intend to put it initially, but I am making sure that I review the final contract. And, um, you know, if the fee does not include interconnection charges, we can at least raise that with the school to let them know it's probably, they should probably still put the charging station where we think it could find a home. Um, is, is, are they picking up the tab for the charging station? Yes. And this is a level three. It's beyond a level, it's a level three mamma jamma or it's a level three juice box. So it's a level three would normally be around 32 kilowatts per hour. And this is 50 kilowatts per hour. So this is a, this is a, this is like a supercharger. This is great. Super duper charger. And the, um, the cost. So the level three charger, that's at like 35 kilowatts per hour. I think I had already mentioned Hingham purchased two of those fully installed for $170,000 or $180,000. Wow. And They're good. a lot. And the level three super duper charger um, is more like $100,000 to $150,000. So what ended up happening, Anel had put in a bid proposing a level two charger that would be provided by National Grid as part of National Grid's program. Of course, time has gone on, so I don't even know if National Grid still has that program in place. But even if they did, what we realized was in the winter, these buses have a parasitic load of 12.5 kilowatts per hour to keep the engine warm. You can't charge the engine if it's cold. So you have to spend 12.5 kilowatts to warm up the box around the engine, and then you can use the electricity to charge it. Um, and because of that, it meant that a level two charger acts like a level one charger in the winter of New England. A level three charger acts like a level two. 
And um, for our purposes, we were basically down to four days, four half days when the buses all needed to run around and only had two hours in between when um, we just needed to be able to top off the buses in the middle of the day. And, and in the summer and the warm months, it might not matter because in the warm months, the buses are more efficient, but in the cold months, it was mathematically a problem, a potential problem. So we did a tabletop great. exercise to figure out what the numbers would allow. And Ray talked to the Boston school system, which has a, um, a bunch of electric buses and found out what their average charge was and what they were using. And the equivalent of Ray, who's in charge of the bus fleet for Boston said, you have to have a level three. You just, you cannot charge your bus with anything other than a level three. Right. Just given the need to top off in the middle of the day. Really, I mean, the Tanya, level, level three to level two is pretty profound drop off in performance in the winter. Well, yeah, the level two, I mean, the level two, because of that 12.5 kilowatt draw, it acts like a level one. So wow. you take 24 hours to charge the bus, mm -hmm. wow. which doesn't help. <laughs> you have school the next day. Steve. Tanya, just a little uh, point of confusion here. Uh, you said that the engines had to be warmed up before they could be charged. First of all, you probably meant the motors. And I'm not even sure where the motors, electrical uh, motors need to be heated up. I know in the Tesla. I'm sorry, the battery. You have to heat the up battery. the batteries. Right. Right. Well, that's what you meant? Okay. Oh, yeah, also. Uh, so am I right? They, they haven't decided where they're going to put the uh, chargers yet, where they're going to park them? Um, I don't know. They at one point everybody was settled on Deer Hill and putting it by the emergency response okay. system, um, the emergency response center behind Deer, Deer Hill, with the anticipation that the permanent home for the bus depot would end up at Deer Hill or you know in that area. Um, but now if they can't move forward with that, they would on an interim basis potentially put it on a third party site. And then there's a fee if they want to move it. Okay. Do you know when they're going to make that decision? They uh, have to make it within 90 days of signing the contract. Okay. 60 days. So they're down to like basically 45 days. Okay. At least for the initial. Have they been um, figuring out as part of the equation, you know, the, the day when everything is, you know, they're all electric school buses and, you know, the load and, and I mean, or, or are they just keeping this as sort of a standalone? This is a standalone. Okay. With For no, now. yeah, okay. So no discussion of, you know. The, the difference in price yeah. between an electric bus and a diesel bus is $325,000 versus 125,000. Right. And the EPA money is not going to fund a town like Cohasset. So unless something profoundly it's a changes, I mean the the electric boxes are never going to really uh, pencil out. Right? I mean it, right, it, it, I mean the cost will have to come way down or the diesel will have to go way up. Yeah, but there's $6 billion of federal money going towards developing the electric school bus manufacturing process, right? Which so there's, hopefully will reduce the unit cost, you're saying. Which could bring us down the cost curve, hopefully. Oh. Hmm. So I think you're right, Chris, that it, it may never, it may not pencil out in the next five years, but it's going to come down the steepest part of the cost curve within the next five years because of the $6 billion that the federal funding is providing. And we're going to pilot and show how it works. And by the time it gets economic, people are just going to want another five or six. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, everything is slower. Everything acts slower than, um, than you would like. There is no, there was a news article very cool, not a school bus, although it should do a school bus, but there was a news article which showed an electric vehicle um, 
basically ran for I think it was like 200 hours without a without needing to get a charge because it was running around a racetrack that had an electric uh, electric recharging system built into the road. Oh, that's cool. And they have done um, they have done pilot projects for something like that in I think either Sweden or Switzerland and in um, the UK. So this concept, especially on highways, is being tested that you can set up the roadways. So as the car drives over it, it basically is constantly recharging. Actually, isn't there even a bus system where they're doing that? I mean, they're 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 doing wireless charging in in a bus system. I wish I remembered where it was, but um, it's yeah. You know. So there's lots of um, lots of things happening. So the economics could be dramatically different when our five year lease expires. And the market could be different. The market for electricity, the demand prices in the market. At one point, the capacity prices in the New England market were, you know, above ten dollars per kW, and and they've been at around two now. So, you know, if you could provide demand response during however many peak peak hours with your bus that you'd be charging, but then not charge you know, there's money to be had there. And that's part of this, that's what part of this demonstration project is looking at showing. So we'll see, but <laughs> Cohasa has its electric bus. One thing I thought about today as I was driving back from Rhode Island, um, having interviewed the senior energy engineer from Brown University, which is going net zero by 2040 is whether we wanted to encourage the school committee to have a bus naming contest for the electric bus. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Just to give it a little personality. Oh, you know, yeah. Ellie Electric. That's a great, that's a great idea. Uh, what was the other one that I, I, I was coming up with all sorts of names. This is what the Carr family <laughs> discusses at the dinner table. So we we're coming up with all sorts of bus <laughs> names, but, you know, let the kids have a bus naming contest for the electric bus just to give it some personality and that's what they did in england right for the boat and it was like Bodie mcboatface was the final <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway there's lots that we can do and um I'll, we'll talk about our new liaison to the school committee when we get to matters not known 48 hours in advance because I just found out today who that new liaison is going to be. Okay, so that's EcoFest, the Grants Electric School Bus Demonstration Project. It's signed, yay. Mass CEC batteries for Harborview. I don't know if Michelle can provide an update, but Ginny, I think has completed her initial review. She received two bids. One came in that they could install two Tesla batteries, um, buy the batteries, install the batteries for around $25,000. Um, the other bid came in at around, I think, $35,000. Well, I was surprised by the difference, Delta. I mean, that was. Well, you know, you have to also realize this is not a formal competitive bid. This is a phone call to say, hey, can you tell me what this is going to cost? Um, so we could, I think we have to have three, we have to reach out to three potential vendors if it's below a certain price in this price range and decide whether we're going to go ahead or not. Um, we do have um, an indication from the Affordable Housing Trust that they would make up the remaining $5,000 with money that they had been given to assist with affordable housing issues as part of a um, the Fletch movie that came to town. And I think they got $10,000. And so they were willing to consider giving us all $10,000, but they would help us make up that difference if we could get it down to $25,000. Um, so I don't know at this point, we've done the due diligence. I think we've gotten an indica indicative bid that 
in my mind could work, but I don't know where the town is. Michelle, I don't know if you're on and can give us an update on that. I, I am. Um, so I did see what Ginny sent back. Um, and you're right, she just has to solicit three quotes. She doesn't necessarily have to get three back. Um, so I believe she's done that. She's solicited three, she has two. Um, I think the only, the only other little hurdle that we have to overcome, and maybe it's already been done, and I'm just not aware of it, is that the housing authority has to give us the go ahead. Um, because the last time we spoke to them, they were concerned about um, installation and upkeep and, and all of those things. So if that hurdle has been overcome, then we should just sign this and get moving. And we have to get the Affordable Housing Trust to formally give us the money. Right. So Chris, do you, should we make it an action item where you and I approach Bobby and Taffy and the executive director of Harborview? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the where we where I left it with Kathy was that we were going to have a site visit and sort of talk about through all these things. And I guess that hasn't happened yet. I thought that was going to happen with the, the vendors, but we we have to make that uh, happen because they, you're right, Michelle. Those are all the questions they have. They sounded a little less enthusiastic when I talked to them than I thought they'd be, but. Because I suspect that they're going to be concerned about outages longer than the half a day or so that the power walls can last. And do they need to maintain their diesel contract? But uh, I just, uh, given that the, so I, I don't know, we have to work through that. All right. So well, where Chris, is this? What, is, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I was going to say, so where is this? Is It seems like now it's on the town side. Um, is Ginny coordinating with them or is she leaving it up to the committee members to coordinate? Well, she was coordinating with them uh, and uh, arranging what I thought were some site visits. I never heard whether they happened or not. But perhaps the action I'm in, Michelle, is that uh, Tanya, I, and we'll get with Jenny and figure out sort of how do we get uh, sort of a quote, an official meeting with the trust to sort this out. Yep. So I'm happy to schedule the meeting um, and, and ask Ginny to attend. Oh, and great. if she can't, I'll attend because we have, I think, 22 days to get this signed in order to get the $20,000 or we lose it. So time is of the essence now to get it done. I don't know. I know she's on vacation. I don't know when she'll be back. So let me just reach out, see if I can get something scheduled. And if you could let me know if you're available if your availability is better in the morning, afternoons, just let me know and we'll get something on the calendar, hopefully for next week. I'm great. wide open next week, Michelle, so I'd be happy to participate in the site visit. Okay, great. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll let you know. Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks. I like that. That sounds like action. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it. Close the deal, man. Yeah. Close the deal. <laughs> Ah, oh, slowly but surely. Two See, Chris, walls. it's like all you have to do is be like water, water drops. Just yeah. keep on flowing. Just keep on flowing, and eventually you make progress. We're about to close some major deals. Like we're about to close um, this year. We may bring in close to six hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars in value to the town. So big one being actually more, I'd say close to 600,000. Big one being the bus, the level three Mamma Jamma charger that we just got for free. The um, continued savings from the solar energy array, which I'm gonna discuss uh, in, in, in a little bit. And 20,000 from Mass CEC. And then there's another 250,000 from Green Communities that I believe Ginny is trying to go after with an application to, um, as part of the Green Communities Act, the remaining amount of money that we have left that we could get to get the um, regulators for Deer Hill and Osgood, I think. And Michelle, actually on that, because that's a, a different grant, 
have we closed up the existing green communities money that we've been given, shown them that we've done what we were supposed to do with that money? So we haven't officially closed it. We have all the documentation we need. The last thing that we needed was a paid invoice to Rexel. Um, and that was paid last week. So as soon as we send that over, it'll officially be closed. And we Woo! can apply for the next round. That's great. And that's in the fall. So we're September. set up to do that. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So that could be another 250. I think we're down to 100 because 100. We, yep, we've reached our threshold. So each year now we're eligible for $100,000, which still is significant. So I think we've already gotten $850,000 from the green communities funding. So that would take us close to 1, 1 million. Yes. Great. So we may by the end of the year be hitting $2 million in value to the town that our tiny little committee has brought. Oh. We should, everybody get your hand, pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Get ready because we'll have a real champagne celebration at the end of the year if we achieve that. But that's our goal. or In my mind, that's our goal. We're going to just close up the initiatives that we have underway and um, bring it in because the opportunities keep flowing. And if you don't use them, you lose them. Okay, let me see. see anything else? The Mass CEC technical assistance. Um, Michelle, do you have an update on that? I know Ginny put together a proposal to get funding for technical assistance from Mass CEC for the MVP work. I, I, I don't have an update on that. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all I'm right. Sure so I think my is understanding process. is, and I haven't gotten a copy of it. I asked Ginny to send a copy of that proposal to me and to Montana, who's collecting grant proposals from us and everybody else. And my understanding is she submitted a proposal for Mass CEC technical assistance for MVP. There was confusion about whether we had already gotten money for it, which we had in 2018, but there was a part two. And she was also, I think, in talking to them, encouraged to move forward with a part one again. And it was basically a hazard mitigation um, type of study, resiliency study. And as part of that, she included in some money for uh, looking at uh, a climate uh, and sustainability study. So we'll find out when she participates at our next meeting, we'll find out exactly when that went in, what it looks like, and hopefully distribute a copy to everybody. Okay, is anything else on grants, Michelle? I know you've not been directly involved with those, but I know it's under your- No, nothing, nothing I can think of at the moment. Okay. I've got a, I've so got a little, go ahead. I got a little news item here that kind of related to grants. It's in the uh, in the category of don't count your, count your chickens before they're hatched. But uh, anyways, uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of the, uh, of, of the, um, uh, Fair share amendment that passed last year, it's a millionaire's tax. So now the state has to decide how to spend the money. And, and it's um, it's um, the money, the revenue is directed to be directed to education and transportation. Um, and there's a serious proposal, and I think it's still being debated in, uh, in the legislature to, whether or not to get into the budget, to offer towns the, the chance to um, replace their school roofs with a solar array on top <laughs> and pay for this out of the millionaire's tax. So <laughs> I've done a little bit of lobbying on that, but I'll, I'll keep you informed if it gets in the budget. Uh, that's good news because we could use that. I think we could apply. Michelle, do we know if the the Commonwealth ever settled down on how old the roofs have to be before you can get <laughs> shared funding? That is, that's a million dollar question. Um, and the answer is no, I don't believe they did. I don't, I don't believe there is a specific time frame. Um, in some instances, they say 
it's 25 years, but push it to 28. In some instances, they replace it 25. I just don't think there's a magic number any longer. Okay, but we know it's not 20 years. We know it's not 20, yes. And 20 years would have given us the Deer Hill School this year, I think. I think it went into operation 2003. Yes. So today, we should, yeah. Debbie, if we could do an action item, which is figure out how old the school roofs are. And I believe that's simply looking at the school roof studies that had been done. And who is it, Michelle, that does the school roof replacements decisions? So are you talking about the MSBA or are you talking about? Who, who gives the 50% or 40% or MSBA. 60%? MSBA. Yeah. Okay. Mass School Building Authority. And actually, currently, that we do have an application into MSBA, but that is for their either um, renovation or replacement of the middle school, high school in its entirety. Right. So, right. Tanya, do you want to assign responsibility for this action item? Um, yes, <laughs> always. If we don't assign responsibility, nobody will do it. I can grab, why don't I grab and circulate the school roof studies that had already been done? It might be on the Cohasa website. I thought I came across them at one point. <clears throat> You know, we also had to find that information out as part of the FEMA BRIC grant because we had, um, I think we had to identify the age of the buildings that we were going to improve as part of that. So I think it's out there and I think we knew it. I just don't know it off the top of my head. And I think it'd be good if we had a record of it. So Tanya, um, what does Ted or anybody say about the idea of building a new school, um, you know, new high school? I mean, that seems like it would factor into some of our discussion. I've heard it's pretty, um, not really on the table that right now, as far as I, I've heard from the school committee, just because it's so expensive and we're not, we're not going to get the money that was around years ago that a lot of the surrounding towns have gotten. That's what I heard, but yeah, the voters I think don't the answer. Seem, oh, go ahead, uh, Steve. The voters don't seem inclined to uh, fund uh, want to fund expensive projects. They turn down the uh, town hall renovation. So but that's different, Steve. For a new school. Mm -hmm. Why well, that's that different? different? Part, part of the reason that was turned down is it was turned down by the parents of the school kids, right? And they turned they it down because that money. they felt. 25 million spent on town hall would be 25 million they could not get spent on the school. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. So I think it's playing itself out, Debbie, is the answer. And I think uh, depending on the infrastructure bill and how that money flows through to the states and how Massachusetts decides to spend it, that may or may not go towards something like that. So sometimes the money comes in fits and starts. And a lot of the money that was used previously was part of the 2008 recovery. If you remember, there was a, a bill passed that had a bunch of money that flowed through to the states as part of ensuring that we didn't go into a recession. Um, and it was for shovel ready uh, projects. Yeah, I was thinking, though, that the school committee might not be receptive to investing in solar roofs if they're going to tear the building down. So I they're just not. OK, they're not. So that's why we aren't even looking at the high school, middle school roofs. And they wouldn't even contemplate use um, putting the carports in the parking lot because they want to have the flexibility to potentially use the parking lot as part of the plan for the new school. <clears throat> so you're absolutely correct. That so far has stymied us on the high school, middle school. 
Uh, and Deer Hill Osgood is different because they're not looking at replacing yeah. Deer Hill and Osgood, but the roofs are now at or beyond 20 years. I think it was like 23, 24, 28, something like that, but we'll get the exact numbers. And that was for 20 year old roofs. So Tanya, I'm just reviewing an old report that I have and mm -hmm. just scanning it quickly. It looks like the, the middle school, high school is 2001, Deer Hill School is also 2001. I haven't gotten to Osgood yet, but I'll get there in just a minute and I can be able to, I can tell you. Great. I never thought I'd be excited to have a 22 year old roof on our schools, but <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> so, I mean, I think our theme is, and if, you know, people ask, we can just say, as soon as the towns replace roofs, we are looking at those rooftops as potential hosts for solar panels because that makes the most sense of course now that the interest rates are higher that the solar panels are so capital intensive that the interest rates make a big difference a big difference and so whereas before we could install solar panels at a price that could guarantee a net savings mm -hmm. with the higher interest rates it becomes harder Plus supply chain issues. But there might soon be some more state money for that purpose. Well, we'll yeah, and they extended the crossed. federal money. So the federal money has been extended. That was at risk. The federal money has been extended for 10 years. The state may continue to encourage this as part of the millionaire's tax or other things. And so I think we just, it's we as always with these roofs, we have to be ready to act. And we tend to, you know, just constantly be um, impatiently waiting for the stars to align. And every couple of years we put out requests for proposals to get pricing. So we have the price transparency. And that has, I think it's informed some of our decisions. But 2020 was the last time we put out a request for proposal. And that's three years ago now. And it appears Stop. in this report, Tanya, that they're all 2001, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I'm going to do a little bit more digging. Okay. So let's do on the action item, Debbie, if you could have Michelle as one of the people doing some digging and Tanya will look at the reports and the dates of the buildings that were put into the brick grant because that will give us an idea of what the school roof dates are. And if we need to, we can just go walk to the schools and look at the plaque that has <laughs> the names of the school committee members who were part of the opening of the school, because that has the date on which they opened as well. Okay. All right. Uh, any other grants, Michelle? I think we basically said no. Yeah, none that I'm aware of. Okay. But look, let's just get these off of our plate and focus on the next round. But, you know, it's nice because we have Montana and we have Ginny who are take, championing, you know, taking the charge on pursuing some of these. We also, I think we've mentioned, and I have mentioned to the school committee, that uh, this whole bus depot concept, we could move forward if they were willing to do carports and the carports could effectively pay for almost half of the cost of the depot, or at least under the old pricing. And if we combined it with the solar and the batteries, uh, the battery storage, and use that as a means of powering the emergency response center, um, with a diesel engine as a backup, just to make sure that the emergency response center had power for sure, we could potentially go after a FEMA brick grant money for a million dollars versus our prior request for 36 million. 
and it would be a, a, con a contest. And so may, uh, if you want, Debbie, make it an action item, I'll look up the FEMA BRIC grant rules for this year. And I'll also reach out to Glenn Pratt to see what his thoughts are on trying to get grant funding. And we'll talk to our liaison about what that person's thoughts are. Okay, new members. So, Michelle, do you know if any new people have applied to be members of the Alternative Energy Committee? I don't believe there are any new applicants yet. Okay, so we have two seats. Applications are open. There's a link on the website. I know, Chris, you've reached out to some people without mentioning names. Do you want to just give us an update on the responses? One we met at the, the EcoFest, uh, and I've sent her the information in these meetings and um, hope that she she should have joined a meeting to, to uh, demonstrate some interest. Uh, and I don't see her here today, so maybe there's not a diminished interest. And another person is definitely interested, but uh, needs a year or so to get out of some conflicts. Right. And so I think we can definitely look if we have a pipeline of people, that would be a good thing. Tanya, did you notify that guy that I I said sent you the email after our last meeting about him? He, you know what? You did, so and that is on my to-do list. So and that was in our meeting minutes. And I read that today. So I will reach out to him keep that as an action item for me and I will get that done this week. I'll give this some more thought too. See if I'm, I can, it'd be nice to um, find folks who are uh, more, you know, Josh's age and younger than, I mean, some of, some of the up and coming parents in town would be nice to get one or two of them on. I'm not quite sure what the delicate way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> we get you look i mean i think the electric school bus will be helpful too but that's going to come after we'd like to get some appointments so uh i just wanted to mention that uh it isn't just alternative energy that has openings uh you know justin contacted tanya and i about doing a little promo for volunteering for town committees and boards there, I guess there are over 40 openings on, on a couple dozen town boards and committees. So it's really, the town is having trouble getting people to step at the plate and, you know, volunteer for these uh, positions. So <laughs> if you know somebody is interested in anything, <laughs> ask them to volunteer the town. Right. Um, so along those lines, Justin was putting together a press release about the electric school bus demonstration project. Michelle, do you know if that's gone out yet or if it's about to go out? I think it's about to go out. He was working on it all week um, and he was, I don't know what he was doing today, but he was putting a bunch of video cuts together. So it's it's nearing its end and it's almost ready for prime time. All right, cool. So as part of my outreach to Justin about the whether or not he needs a blurb about the Alternative Energy Committee open seats, we can perhaps put something in the... Uh, if it gets picked up by the press, we can add that to the discussion, which is we're always looking for participants and we have two open seats. And that could be a good way to generate. And then Josh on social media and marketing, maybe we can somehow advertise that and encourage people to apply. Okay. Uh, okay, data report. Yes. Hold on. I sent that around on email. We'll include it in the meeting minutes. And that indicates that we are at around 383,000, I believe, of yep. savings. Yep. The rate dropped pretty. The rate did drop to, as we knew it would. 42 to 27. Um, 
yeah, the rate dropped, but we're still making some pretty good money. Yeah, I mean, savings. we're going to have a, a better year. We're going to surpass previous years by August this year, it looks like. <clears throat> yeah, last year was a blockbuster year because of the high prices. And I think this year is also going to be blockbuster year because of the high prices. And in the summer, even though the prices are down, the quantity is up. Yeah. So we actually end up saving, usually we save more in the summer. And this last winter was just different because prices were so out of whack. So again, the savings, it's a very rich deal, but I think we still have opportunities for guaranteed savings, including the stop and shop. Michelle, do we have an update on the stop and shop plaza? Contract. I do not have an update on that. Okay, is Chris waiting for the National Grid study to be done? I have to follow up, Tanya, on that one. Okay, because that is what he told the select board that you know we we don't the pressure is not on because National Grid's doing their own study, a cluster study of our transformer and. All of the everybody in the queue, half of which are probably not real projects um, and trying to figure out how to do it. But this is just National Grid's modus operandi, which is when suddenly there's a whole bunch of solar panels going up in a community. They just pump the brakes and slow everything down. Right. So that is where we are right now. But if we have an actual project and call them, you know, they, they have made it sound like it's not a definitive no. We just we have to get things done. Okay, so and at some point, the deal that we got is going to go away, right? Right now, it's a twelve, it's a three-year-old deal from Palmer Capital, and they're being gracious by sticking to it. But at some point, they can get another buyer for the exact same deal, and another buyer can get the guaranteed savings. So, it'd be nice if we could just have the however many hours of legal review to get it finalized and get it signed and have it ready to go. And if and if there's some reason why we don't want the guaranteed savings on our electricity bill, like let's just let them know that so that they're not, you know, they're trying to do right by the town because they're locally based, but there are other buyers in the market who would like to have guaranteed savings. I'll follow up Chris on that. Tanya, are you saying that we can get all our ducks in a row? Well, uh, and just when when um National Grid says, okay, the internet connect issues are solved. We can be right there, ready to go. I mean, we don't, this, yes. doesn't, this doesn't have, you're saying it doesn't have to be done in sequence. Yes, I would say exactly that. And I also would say that if we can get the contract signed, we can go to National Grid and say, we have a project the town would like. It has guaranteed savings for the town of 1.25 cents per kilowatt hour guaranteed savings. And, and it's a bunch of solar panels on the stop and shop rooftops, which is a perfect place to put them. What's whole, why can't we get this done? Yeah. And with National Grid, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease, even though they're supposed to abide by the queue. But you know, the queue has, for example, it has Deer Hill and Osgood roofs in it. It has MBTA parking lot. Uh, 1.75 megawatts of solar panels at the MBTA station. So these are things in the queue that they're studying and they're not real projects right now. So we have a real project and I think we can say to them, knock these projects out and put this project in. Yeah, Tanya, just a point of clarification that the, the uh, stop and shop deal was 12 and a half percent sort of discount on the going rate. Is, is that right? Correct. Yeah, okay. You know, to, so when it started, it was around one point two five cents because the going rate was ten cents. Got it. Okay. You know that article I sent around a couple weeks ago. If, if people like being miserable with other folks, I mean, this is sort of a national issue. I mean, all the utilities are pumping up brakes. I I have to ask: Is Palmer Capital solved the inverter problem at the uh, landfill yet? I'm sorry. What? Steve? Palmer Capital solved the, the inverter problem that they've been having at the solar array. Uh, I'm no. wondering, no. 
<laughs> I didn't God. realize that was still a problem, Steve. Is that that's still an issue? Well, the reason that they can't expand there is because they their inverters seem to be unstable or something. I don't know. They can't solve a technical problem. It makes me a little worried if that they know what they're doing if they can't even you know take some two years to work on an inverter problem. Well, I think it's a everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else. I don't think it's Palmer Capital's problem. I think it's National Grid is pointing the finger at the inverter manufacturer. The inverter manufacturer has replaced the inverter three times, and now they're saying it's not our inverter. It's the system. You can't have three inverters going, you know, having problems. So it's something about that part of the distribution system. And National Grid is saying, no, it's not us. So I think that's the problem. It's not a Palmer Capital problem. I think it's a distribution system. We have an old distribution system. And that is a particularly weak part of the system. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, charging stations. Josh, do you have any good news for us on charging stations? May was the highest month um, that we this year. So um, did about 10 megawatts last month. You want me to share my screen? Yep. Yeah. Great. And then if you could send this to Debbie so she could put it into the minutes. Yeah. All right. So as you can see, we had a 134 unique drivers, which is more than the rest of the, the months, as well as more sessions and um, as well as more energy. Do we have anywhere, Josh? How, I mean, we're we're paying for this, right? The town's paying for all this. Do we know right. how much we're spending? Is there a little tally where we how much we spend? It's over here. So in the last month, it was a couple of grand. You know, one eight eight seven left side here. Utility costs for the last thirty days for ten megawatts. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've probably spent ten grand. You know, nine grand this year. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tanya, they did bring back our uh, environmental impact here with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Excellent. Excellent. So if you could screenshot that and send it to Debbie, yeah. that would be helpful to include. Um, so that number, just so you know, Chris, is not, it's an estimate based on the default supply rates, but the town has a third party supplier, which has a locked in rate, which is a sweetheart deal right now. Mm -hmm. much lower than the default supply rate. For, so the actual cost of the town is less. Mm -hmm. However, I think it was 12, 12 cents. Is that what you said at one point? Um, I think, I think it is something like that. Yeah. Yeah. However, remember this committee did make a recommendation last year in July to the town that they should start charging. And we gave a simple way to start charging. And we suggested that it may not be perfect, but it would give us information on what the demand response is and whether 134 unique drivers drops to 10. We just don't know how, res how price responsive, how price sensitive the people who are charging are. You know, right now it's free. So people have been doing that. Michelle, do you have information on this? I do. So as of July 1st, we are going to start charging. Um, we have loaded everything into the system as far as a fee structure. Um, we're working with someone at charge point to see if they believe that that's going to work best for us because with the municipalities, it's unique. Um, there aren't many municipalities which charge. Um, so we're testing the waters. Um, with lower fees and our fees are, are more based not on demand of the actual charging, but how long they leave their car on the charger. So there'll be penalties for leaving your car on the charger for longer than um, an average charge time. And then every two hours thereafter. So they're seeing that that, is the, that gives the best re result in return on investment. Um, 
because the utility cost, like you said, we have a sweetheart deal. So we'll make we'll make up our money quickly just by asking people to get off the chargers. And if they're not off the chargers, they're penalized. So we're Good. still gonna give them a free charge, but they have to remove their car. Oh, so. you're did I hear you right? You're not going to really charge only if they leave their car. Yes. Park there. Um, the charge is minimal. I, it's a couple of cents. Um, oh. it, the real charge comes in if you leave your car longer than the charge time. And okay. um, they've seen significant results with that. So well, what about the problem of people who simply, you know, non EVs that park in the spots and <laughs> or even EVs and don't plug in, you know, they just sit there. <laughs> without plugging in then the, then uh, the charge point charger doesn't even know they're there well right but we wouldn't be paying for that anyhow so that's just that's more of a um a monitoring issue than yeah. a oh, charge by the way issue. you might be interested after our last meeting when i was a bit disappointed that most of the most of the charging spots were taken up by non-evs so i i wrote up a nice little note very polite note mentioning the alternative energy committee that I was going to put in people's windshields. Well, uh, two days ago, I went to uh, both the town town hall lot and the uh, library lot, and there were no non EVs parked there. <laughs> <laughs> All the cars parked there were charging. Everything was perfectly legit, so I didn't get a chance to put my note in anybody's windshield. <laughs> they they feared your note, so they knew ahead of time not to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Michelle, did you say the charging was going to be free, but the penalty was going to be fairly steep? Yeah, that right you said. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you know what the penalty will be for the minutes? I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm happy to send it to you on Monday. I'm not in tomorrow, but Monday I'll be able to send it to you. Fine. Just tow it up. This is a very this is a very curious approach. I really want to be interested to see how that all turns out. And the good news, Steve, is you get your charging for free still. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> I don't quite understand the logic of that, but that's great. I love it. <laughs> well, so what we're seeing, to, so yes? what we're seeing is we have several vehicles day after day that plug in and leave them, and and they're there all day long. Yeah. We we don't have visibility into who the owner is, and therefore, I think you're talking about the Cohasset uh, EVs. If they're always they, here. Well, if there was a penalty in place, people would move them. And that's the intention. <laughs> yeah, I don't really think that's a problem. I around. think the only cars that are parked there for long periods of time uh, are the uh, Cohasset EVs. Well, I, I think, Steve, we talked about true. this last time. The data, yeah. this does not include the town hall. Yeah. And if you right. just look at this, I mean, we had 134 unique drivers, you know, 534 sessions, and the average length is six and a half hours. That's, that's amazing. for all these sessions, which is surprising. Yeah, that's not the town's three EVs. Yeah, I think I think well, every time I go there, I see the town's EVs in the in the in the spots. Well, I think uh, Michelle, I think we're making big bucks in this one. Can't wait to see the. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you better start saving up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no overnight charging, Steve. I was just going to say, we won't have any more weekend warriors, that's for sure. <laughs> well, that's great news. Thank you, Michelle. I know that's been a process, but um, thank you for doing all the detailed work underlying getting to this point. Yes, thank you. And Michelle. it will be interesting to see what happens. Yes, for sure. Okay, marketing and social media. We've talked about Justin putting out a press release on the electric school bus demonstration project. We talked about him trying to encourage people to apply to the open seats on different committees. Is He's there anything that we want about to it. Do? Has anybody actually talked with him about the school bus? I sent him, he asked for data and I gave him a list of data points. Um, talking points tied to the school buses and some quotes from me and suggested he get some quotes from the school committee and Anel in the town.
I can send you a copy of that if you want, Josh. And if no, you want I just, to just follow I don't, up I, with him. When I follow up with him, I don't want to be double tapping him on with everything if um if people have already talked to him about it. I know. No, he sees uh, he reached out and said, I'm putting together a press release. Do you have any data that I can include in? Yeah. Okay. Anything else on marketing and social media? Okay, matters not reasonably known in advance. Um, so I think as soon as we get the new members, we should um, do an official vote on positions. And I would be happy to have somebody take over the chair position um, and either just be a member or whatever. So if there's somebody who's dying to be the chair, I encourage you. Um, if you're comfortable continuing on as we're continuing on, th that's fine too. But I think let's be thinking about it now and bring in the new members and then we should have a vote to re um, officially set up the leadership and the positions in, the, in, in this committee, just from a committee hygiene point of view. Um, other matter not reasonably known in the advance, I found out tonight who the liaison from the school committee is going to be for our committee. Lydia, as you may know, who was our liaison for years, um, has left the school committee. And so she is no longer, that's why she hasn't been attending. And so she, Lydia is no longer our liaison. And the new liaison from the school committee to our committee is a Mr. Ted Carr. Which my children find hilarious. No, this is fabulous. You know, this, is going to be, this is going to be an amazingly smooth communication process. Right. Well, right. I, I think they may have um, figured out he's already sort of gunning for the the betterment of the town based on the ex the excellent recommendations of the Alternative Energy Committee, and by creating an official position. Um, Everything's, you know, there's no apparent or unapparent conflict of interest, but there's no conflict of interest because it's, you know, broader general um, decision making. Uh, he also was asked to be the chair of the school committee and he declined and said that he would prefer to be considered for that position next year in his final year of his term when his youngest daughter is, and at this point he apparently started crying because his youngest daughter will be the third and last of our children graduating from the Coasset school system. And just the thought of it, including at the dinner table tonight, made um, my big teddy bear of a man get all choked up. So um, I think, uh, you know, I'm glad there's a positive response. I, I, I think it's, you know, anybody we have, as long as we have people, I mean, personally, I don't know who's going to feed the kids, but at this point, they're teenagers. So I will try to make sure the dogs are fed before our Thursday meetings. And that's only one day a month. So if everybody in our household goes to bed hungry, that's fine. Well, we can take we can take turns feeding them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> We'll send DoorDash. Yeah. They can come over. Yeah, don't house, worry. Right? They yeah. already know how to do that. And then they know how to Venmo us a request to pay for it. So <laughs> I, they're they're more than covered. They're more than covered. And they uh they have actually they're quite good little chefs as well. So um, so that's our new liaison from the school committee. And I think we will start including him on our invitations starting next month. That's and great. um if he it continues to be as supportive as he has been when he wasn't our liaison. I think we are in good shape. So, uh -oh. all right, we'll we're monitoring this very closely. Yes, and if anybody feels like there is a conflict or it's not working well, please feel free, open communication, to let us know. Um, but I think I think he's going to be fascinated participating in our 
meetings and except for the fact that our youngest daughter turned 16 today and he was out making sure she got all the makeup she wanted from Ulta um, he would be participating on this call all right um, anything else matters uh, not reasonably known in advance I do uh, I've got a just a calendar item that uh, somebody here might be interested in the uh, Woods Hole group is making their second presentation of their study on on uh, climate risk in Cohasset, uh, flooding, flooding, tidal surges, rising seas, storms, and that stuff uh, on Monday at six o'clock. So if, if anybody's interested, I'm going to go. That's great. I would just suggest if more than three people go, um, nobody can have discussion because it would be a violation of the open meeting laws because we'd have a quorum. If we think more than four, more than three people want to go, then we can call a meeting for Monday and then people can discuss and ask questions as much as they want. Can we go just as Cohasset? Like, uh, I didn't realize it was to be that strict that we couldn't go and like, we just can't talk to each other. <laughs> Um, you, if, if four of us go as Cohasset residents, it is a meeting of the alternative. We have a quorum of the members of the alternative energy committee, and that's where we have to be careful. So there was a point, if you remember, we had a meeting, I don't know if it was last year, I think it might've been last year or a year and a half ago when we were talking about electric buses and we had four members of the select, no, three members of the select board were attending our meeting. And it was fine when nobody was saying anything. And then all of a sudden a person asked a question and I had to remind them that they had three people and therefore there was a quorum of the select board on our meeting. And that discussion, they could not discuss, they could ask a question, but they couldn't have any discussion. At which point Diane Kennedy immediately dropped off. So, we just well, I want I remind the rule people. is we can't we can't talk among ourselves, but we can ask a question of the you know the presenter or make a comment in there, right? As, as well, if you make a comment, that's a discussion, right? So you're now having a discussion with a quorum of our committee without calling a meeting. Oh, even if it's, it's okay. Not a meeting of ours. I mean if we have a quorum. We have an unposted meeting happening. If there's discussion, if we're if we're not if we're like a black screen or not showing up because we're just a participant, it's fine. If we're four four of our pre faces are in the meeting and we're talking about the topic, and it's a topic that has to do with our committee, which it could be tied to the resiliency. We just it, it that would be a violation of open meeting laws because we would not have posted it as a meeting. Okay, so, sure. I'll send a round. Going, maybe I, I'm wondering how here. So we got uh, quorum in the committee. I, here. I mean, I, I don't intend to go. Listen so to Steve, if you and Josh go, that would be a great representation. And Debbie, if you want to go, that'd be a great reputation. I, I wasn't going as a representative of alternative energy. I was just going. You don't a, have to, Steve. I, I will send you the I language. For the okay. Meeting law requirement, but I'm just saying I'm not going as a representative. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> I it right. And I know that we that still violate the open meeting law if they had a, a, a forum there, but I'm I'm just telling you if I go by myself, I'm not representing all term energy. <laughs> I think they would play it safe. And Steve, anytime I see you out in public, I'm not gonna even talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do mean, have one more thing. Part, no, what happened at that eco fest? Was that an open was that one of our meetings? That's uh, <laughs> We didn't quite well, well, at the time, but I don't think there were four, right? We oh, never no, had there four. were. And if you recall, I said we cannot talk about anything related to our committee. Oh, and okay. of course, the whole thing was related to the committee. So I said, <laughs> you, you two better skedaddle. <laughs> we had five people there at one point. Oh, did we really? I didn't know that at one time all together. Hmm. <laughs> I just remember you, I, and Debbie. It's <laughs> so, I mean, to be honest, I should have. 
I just thought the timing was not going to overlap. So I should have posted a meeting just to be safe, but I did not. Um, and again, the safest thing is just post a meeting saying we're going to attend this thing. And then it doesn't matter because we've posted the meeting. But if we, if we have a quorum and we show up and it's on a topic related to our committee and we're having discussion, that is a violation of open meeting laws because we did not post a meeting. So I'll send the language just so everybody's clear on that. Um, but it sounds like Josh may go, Steve is going, I'm not going. And then if, you know, Debbie is, is or is not going or Chris is or is not going, just if you find yourself in a situation like we did at EcoFest and there's more than four, more than three of us, we can't have a discussion. And we should probably, one person should probably walk away. That's, just to keep everything clean. Right. I'm not going to okay. talk about it anymore. All right. <laughs> I do have one more. You're not going anymore? Well, I think you can, Josh, because I don't. What? Chris, are you going? Or Debbie, do you want to go? You know, I, d I don't really know right now. So I'm I'm not going to yeah, commit. Sure. Or... Okay, but I think Chris and I are not going. So you won't have four people. So you won't have a quorum. There's one more thing. Uh, the Map C people want to do, you know, they've agreed to, to give us a briefing and they gave us a couple of dates. Um, kind of gone back and forth on this, but does June 26th and 27th work from three to five? Do either of those work better for you guys? It's like a Monday or a Tuesday from three to five. They don't, they won't do it during our meeting time. They want to do it. During and what time. are they going to talk about? They're going to brief us on the carbon footprint report. Oh, right. Right. I'm available on either of those times, and we would need to post a meeting. Can, can others attend? When is that, Josh, do you say? It was either uh, June 26th or 27th, which is either Monday or Tuesday, from 3 to 5. I'm not sure it's going to take couple hours but Josh you did get a hold of them huh because we know. talked about that <laughs> yeah. I hit her twice two days in a row I was like I need the, I need you to give me some dates for today. oh good for you <laughs> so um yeah so I I'm available both days I think this is this is really exciting I have a lot of availability but not not uniformly so what what do you want to throw out some times or um do you have a you said throw out some times yes yeah, so the 26th or 27th from three to five the oh times. from three to five okay yeah. great three to five 26 i'm okay yeah i um well hmm. uh i don't know there's a there's a uh committee a little work i do at work there, there's a committee meeting potentially one of those tuesdays so i i am attentive so monday would be better for you the 26th well, both days are sort of I have holds for this committee. Oh, okay. Really Got it. Got it. Yeah. So. Okay. So, what do you think about doing this in person, or or do they want to do it on Zoom? Go to Boston. Um. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to probably get into Boston and back. That's. Well, that's true. They're not going to come out for us. Yeah. And if we, if we do. Do it online virtually. We can record it if, for those who can't make it. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's do that. Let's just, I, I agree, Debbie. And actually, now that COVID's behind us, oh, I was going to say, we should have like a committee event celebrating our success, but then we'd have a quorum and we'd be violating open meeting laws. Well, we so unless we posted party. it as a meeting. <laughs> so I would say, Josh, um, why don't you schedule then send me, or if you want to put together the agenda, I can send you the template and you can just say who's speaking and you'll, we'll need to request a dial in number from Michelle or can Jimmy. I my, can I set it up myself or no? We've had so many challenges um, with Zoom. I know how to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> me too. That, <laughs> open, that opens up on time. I know, and, and that is a good point. And since Michelle's not on, I am going to 
talk to them about it because this um we've had this happen more than once this year like more than once this year and we all have valuable time and it just looks unprofessional and i get it it's a municipality but Mm -hmm. um, yeah we just need one of us to be able to start i mean i guess i don't know maybe i I would think as long as the link is posted on our you know on our website so people could access it I mean, it, you know, we, we could make the argument it doesn't matter as long as it's the the link is accessible. It's it's a town policy, just to control knowledge of the meetings, and by going through them to get the Zoom link, they then know what committees are meeting when, and by having their people set it up, they then hit recording and they know that it's recorded, and they can then have a record of what happened so it's a process that they set up as part of when this first started happening to try to have some control over what was a new way of doing meetings but i the the points well taken which is we've had multiple meetings where we did not start on time through no fault of our own there have been some where it has been some of our faults. We didn't have a quorum, but most of the time it's a technical issue or it's somebody doesn't know how to do it or whatever. And I think I, I will, um, you, Debbie, you can officially put it in the notes. Tanya is going to talk to Chris Sr. and a member of the select board about improving the professionalism of the process we just need to be made too i think is really what would alleviate some of these challenges if one of us is co-host they can start the meeting well it's also i'm sending out emails like you know we know that we're meeting at the second thursday of every month so there's no reason for me to have to go chasing after a LinkedIn account, uh, you know, a LinkedIn. And at one point, Michelle did do um, a series, which was the second Thursday of every month. And it turned out that didn't work because when you do that, you can't promote to panelist or it has to be a, so I, there was some, we tried it and it was one of our problem meetings. So I think it's a question of improving the process and it's just a question of sitting down with the people who are responsible and setting up a process that by X day, they have a LinkedIn number, they've sent it to us to put into the agenda. There's no reason that needs to wait until we post the agenda or the day we're posting the agenda. It could be done the week before and it should be. Number two, somebody is lined up and they know they're lined up to to open it up and turn it over immediately to somebody else on our committee and maybe that's our scribe or maybe we have it be the vice chair or maybe we have we create a position for meeting monitor and that's the person who does it so maybe it comes from us but i think that's going to be part of our discussion when we think about how do we want to structure ourselves to be effective yes coming to speak if they can't get in for 20 minutes i mean like you said it's totally unprofessional just well i it's not just the guest i mean it's the guest it's the it's us us too but i I know but like we kind of volunteered and yeah i know it just guests cause me more anxiety than panel us yeah i mean look i I, (laughs) as you all know because i have mentioned this multiple times i spent a lot of energy being patient with the process because it is at a pace that is very different than the pace i'm used to operating on but that patience is like I don't have any patience for unprofessional meeting organization, right? And there's things that are outside of my control that make it hard for us to keep it in order. And that's where a conversation just has to come in. If this is the policy you want to do, then we have to make it effective and professional because we all look stupid when a meeting doesn't start for 20 minutes. Yeah, if we want to be attractive to volunteers, we have to be on time and efficient. Yep, exactly. I'm just curious, how many, um, do you know how many uh, um, boards or committees are still meeting on Zoom? I don't know. 
I mean, I'm wondering if we're one of the most of them are hybrid. Uh, I actually, I don't know if most of them are hybrid. Select board is hybrid where they are meeting in person, but they're recording it. School committee, they're meeting in person, but recording it. Um, I don't know how advisory is doing it. And I don't know how capital planning is doing it. And I don't know how, I think that water yeah, I just thought commissioners whether are meeting we were. In um, can I, we're not gonna have another meeting before this MAPC meeting, right? Um, so Josh, do you want, I mean, we, you know, I know you and I talked a little bit about, you know, what we wanted to get out of the meeting with them. Are we going to instruct them about um, some of the things that we're looking for? What's your, what's your thinking about this? And yeah, I mean, I guess we have, you know, I'll have to kind of bring our own questions. You want to, if you want to pull together a set of questions um, that we can go through, I mean, that might be a good exercise. Do you um, think we should send in advance, you know, sort of what we're, what we're hoping to achieve? Because it seems like from our conversation that the original people that were involved in the inventory aren't there. Right. So I'm just curious about who actually is stepping up. And I think, you know, there's certain things I basically, Josh and I had an informal conversation about, um, you know, wanting to really get a benchmark that we could work with to see what kind of progress we're, we're making, you know, um, and how they got the information about, you know, where they, they put the benchmarks in and whether we could update it and or or they would or you know we wanted to we wanted to just kind of see how they got it how we could manage it and how we could keep track going forward of our progress that's what i'm hoping that we could find out yeah i mean if you and i think you know sharing questions or you know, goals that we have beforehand, you know, is a nice thing to do for them so they can be prepared to answer them. Um, so yeah, feel free to send them over to me. I can forward them on, compile them. Well, I want, I want to make sure I understand this is a next meeting or July meeting. We're going to have MAPC. Uh, That's right. It's going to be, I think we June. If June, okay, I was going to do June 26. It sounded like that might be better. Oh, okay. No, not a regular meeting. It's going to be before our next regular schedule. Yeah. It's going to be a special right. meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very and, good. And Steve, it's going to be three to five or three to four. We'll set okay. up for three to five. Sure. So, so anyway, since we're not meeting and, and, um, but maybe we could, but once again, we're going to have to figure this out because we will be on an email giving feedback. Um, and, you know, so I don't know whether we're going to trip. It's, ourselves it's fine up. if it's not a quorum, Debbie. That's why we do subcommittees. And that's why subcommittees are three people or less. So are you going to make a subcommittee to get ready for the MAPC meeting, I guess? Is that what you're saying then? Well, we don't have to create a subcommittee. It's just if two people, if you and Josh are coordinating, or you, Josh, and I are coordinating, that's three people. It's not a forum. Okay. All right. So so if anybody else wants to give feedback about what they'd like about the meeting, I guess they would just contact one of us. Right. Yeah, and yep. maybe what we could do too is just like, um, since we're not, a lot of these questions are going to come up after or during they're, they're talking, we could, you know, just come up with more questions after they're done and either ask for a follow up or just, you know, have them answer the questions we have at the end of their presentation. Because we're going to have a bunch of questions, but they might be just answered in their presentation. So either way, I mean, if you if you have questions, we're happy to share them with them. I don't think that. You know, I would say this. Let's just the three of us 
and, and I'd like my role to be simply facilitating the um, the meeting and the posting of the meeting and trying to make sure that somebody is there to open it up on time. And I, and I will tell you today, again, it, it's frustrating because I specifically wrote emails today saying, Jenny has informed me she's going to be out of town. Who is opening the meeting? And, and I got confirmation somebody was going to open the meeting. And the meeting didn't open. So, you know, it's just, we, there's only so much you can do to try to have things lined up. At some point, it's a question of professionalism and making sure that process is followed and it wasn't followed again. But I'll help to coordinate that. And Debbie, if you and Josh can coordinate on what the content is and letting them know what we want to hear, that'd be helpful too. Are you okay with that, Josh? Yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah. We can go through the report together if you'd like. Set some sure. time. Or up. just, yeah. Would, would you include me on that? I, I maybe have a question I'd like an APC to answer. So is there a report, Josh, that's available, you say? There is. I can, uh, you could just send it to us. That'd be great. I sent it out at one point. Um, okay. I, I'll resend it. Thank you. Yep. Oh, I, I just want to make sure. So we're still going to have our regular July meeting. That'd be on the 13th, right? Yes. Okay. And I'll, that's when I'll we invite, would like to have. I'll try to invite John again and see if he can make it on the 13th. Okay, great. And we have to be sure and, to send him the agenda this time. <laughs> well, let's both of us send him the agenda. Steve, just to make sure he gets it. Okay. Do you guys want to talk MAPC tomorrow? Or is that too early? <laughs> huh? Do you want to talk to, do you want to talk about the questions we want to ask tomorrow at some point, or do you want to set up a time next week? Well, I'd like to look at the report again. Okay. So, let's so if you could week. send that, yeah. And just to see, but I, I do remember. You know, there we had a lot of questions about how they got the the uh, data. Yeah, and, right. That's what I want to make sure that. We yeah. Get them and how they did did that? Mm -hmm. Are they just using census data, or is it real? You know, data. You right. know, where did it come from? And that's why I think it's important to let them know that these are our questions, because these new people might not have the answer. They may not right. know right. exactly right. how that was done. I want to know the details. So Tanya in in Hingham, they they're doing a greenhouse gas inventory too, right? Yes, the, as part almost, of. I have to. I'm yep. gonna have to jump jump off. I family just came home. I just gotta gotta say. Yeah. Well, well, let's. Why don't we close up? Because Debbie, we haven't put on the agenda talking about the Hingham thing but yes they have a climate they have a um, carbon inventory and they're about to post their climate action plan okay okay i move we, we close the meeting okay thank you chris do i have a second josh do you yeah. want a second yes i second all right Bye. all in favor aye, aye. aye. okay aye. Bye, everybody. thank aye. you everybody bye, bye. all right